We've decided that um, we need to um, have more regular briefings on the progress that Sarah is making alongside the many organisations in Christchurch and the Greater Canterbury area uh, moving towards recovery. This is quite a, uh, we think, a good story to tell and it's very easy to get caught in the uh, minute of, of individual circumstances which are important uh, but not necessarily reflective of the wider effort that's going on to get uh, uh, this city and the um, areas of Selwyn and Waimakariri uh, back on track. Uh, Roger's now been in the job for four weeks and uh, so um, you know, in that time a lot of things have shaped up uh, extremely well and we're pretty, pretty pleased with the process, progress. Uh, we're joined this morning by um, Gail Kettle from EQC um, who will run through with you a, a, a whole run, range of uh, progresses that uh, EQC are making, but also uh, Kelvin Berryman from the Natural Hazards Platform at GNS, um, and he's going to give you an update on what we know about the geology under the city, um, and uh, looking at the, the sort of seismic outlook as much as it can be predicted. Um, and uh, generally following the theme I said some weeks ago, when we did the last one of these uh, out at Papua Nui, that we don't want to get into a situation where people feel as though something is known and they're not being told because that would be completely unfair. I think um, the uh, work is progressing towards getting sale and purchase agreements uh, uh, to make those available um, by the end of August or early September uh, to those people in the red zone, in the worst affected uh, suburbs uh, and we would expect that there'll be quite a large take up of the government op offers uh, by those people. Um, there is um, work progressing in the orange areas uh, and the technical data is coming through. That has to be assessed by people who know what that technical data is telling them. Um, and uh, we, would, we are just asking for that as quickly as possible. The order with which uh, we expect to progressively release um, uh, areas, uh, firstly uh, the white areas in Selwyn and Waimakariri, and we would expect that by the end of next week uh, we can make determinations about uh, those areas. Uh, I'd have to speculate probably going green. Uh, the orange areas in Waimakariri, um, namely uh, the, the uh, north and south Kaipoi and Pines Beach, uh, would be the next off the blocks uh, sometime after that. Uh, and then progressively moving into the city, um, Brooklands, uh, Pines Beach, um, and into the other larger parts of the city. The areas around the river to the northwest of the city where much of the assessment is on an individual property by property basis because area wide solutions won't quite work, um, will take a, a little time longer. Uh, but I do want to assure you that there is a huge effort going in to uh, make sure that we can get a good result, or uh, sorry, a definitive result for people in those areas um, as quickly as possible. Roger might like to highlight some of the work that's uh, going on, some of the responses, uh, etc. Well, I, I guess the key, one of the key work streams we've got on is just for people who are in the red area trying to make sure um, we get their information as quickly as possible when we make further determinations. We're also looking at trying to establish a hub um, close to them where they get information from their insurance companies, from EQC, from people building house, house packages and so on. So that work's proceeding as quickly as we can. Um, but I guess the other real focus is just trying to get the, the orange issues resolved as quickly as, uh, quickly as possible and getting them information as we make those determinations. I think it's worth mentioning that the demolition program in the uh, central city is running at a, at a very good sort of, uh, uh, with a very good momentum. Um, there is a large number of, uh, of uh, demolition machinery, a large amount of demolition machinery in there and quite a significant number of traffic movements each day in and out of the city. There are some people saying to us, why aren't you just going 24-7? Uh, well, that would mean that trucks would roll past some residential areas 24-7, um, and we think that's probably a little unfair. Uh, there's also uh, the safety issue, which still remains uh, of concern for um, workers inside the CBD. The large buildings, uh, work is progressing, uh, so the initial stages of uh, demolishing the uh, um, Grand Chancellor have begun with the uh, progressive removal of some car parking area to put on a tower crane, etc. Um, and the um, 
uh, with, when it comes to the uh, building behind us, uh, Clarendon Towers, uh, uh, a demolition method, uh, methodology is being worked out. One of the things I think is hard for people is you sort of see occasionally on television large buildings being blown up and they hit the deck and they're all gone in a matter of seconds. Uh, what that sort of uh, doesn't show is often that there's a terrific amount of spare space around the edges of those buildings uh, and that someone has generally been able to go into what is what in most cases are very sound buildings, just old and past their use-by date uh, for, in an economic sense, um, and spend sort of seven, eight uh, weeks, uh, up to three months, uh, drilling holes in columns, um, roping them up with all sorts of explosives, etc. Uh, the buildings that we're dealing with are unstable, and so taking um, high-pressure um, air-type air equipment to drill holes in columns everything else uh, has its own dangers. Um, so that's why conventional methods are, are probably going to be to the fore in most of these cases. Um, really, the, the handout that's been given to you is a, an attempt to give out a whole lot of information about, about things, uh, but I'm sure it raises a number of questions. Uh, one thing I think is worth highlighting and is probably a little unseen is the amount of work that's going on to prepare for um, getting the infrastructure of the city up, up to uh, speed. So all the issues around putting together that contracting alliance are um, being dealt with um, and we'd expect the full alliance agreement to be in place uh, relatively soon. But it's not stopping the effort that's going in at the moment. Uh, so there's, you'll see there that there's over a thousand people working on uh, the roading, sewer, wastewater, water issues, um, you know, 500 trucks. Um, and 100, 178 uh, excavators, etc., with various types of other equipment. And that's all an effort going on outside of the demolition that's in the, uh, in the, uh, going on in the, in the CBD. So a heck of a lot of, of work going on around the city um, and uh, you know, all, all uh, directed towards trying to get us back into as good a uh, position as possible. Roger, do you have anything else you want to say? Or oh, no, I, mean, I think, I think the, the wind-up in terms of the work, the physical work going out there in the field, in terms of the water, the sewage, the roads, I think it's running at about three times. The capital program is running about three times the normal rate would run at. So, And that over the, over the years is going to wind up to like five times the rate it would normally run at. And by sort of this time next year, it's going to be running at sort of ten times the normal rate. So I think in the city we normally spend about $50 million a year. And um, I think by this time next year we'll be spending something like $500 million a year. So you know, really, really big money. I think the economic data that you've got there is useful as well. I see um, there's some questioning this morning of, of uh, national growth figures on the basis of uh, uncertainty about Christchurch. But I'll tell you what, the, the paymark stuff doesn't lie. That tells you in the retail sector uh, what's going on. And what you'd notice on that line is that uh, the weekends are generally very, very good. Uh, the weekdays it's, is where you're getting that downturn. Uh, and that, I think, does reflect the fact that you've got six or seven hectares behind us that is completely locked down with no retailing activity uh, going on. So those, uh, those are pretty good figures and um, you see the dip on June the 13th but it's starting to trend up again uh, from that point. Um, I think the um, other stuff to look at in there is the amount of export out of Canterbury which is a huge tribute uh, to the, the Canterbury business community without any doubt. And uh, uh, while it to some extent reflects commodity price, it's product that's going over the wharf, and um, that's uh, that's entirely due to the efforts of uh, of those people who are in the um, in the, uh, the the businesses. I think the the welfare stats are good. Um, what we were anticipating, uh, you might recall, six months ago, hasn't uh, come and come to uh, uh, hasn't tr proved to be the case, um, and. Uh, there's plenty of evidence now that there, is, there are people advertising desperately for staff here in Canterbury, so we'd hope that those unemployment numbers uh, also start to um, show a, 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 um, a, you know, a good, um, good result. But, I mean, you can argue, I think, with the, I think the, the numbers are 1,000 extra unemployed or some number like that, Minister. And I think, I, I mean, I put it in the context of 50,000 people used to work in the CBD. So I think the resilience of the Canterbury economy at the moment is really quite extraordinary, really, considering the size of the event we've had. Yeah.